How silly would it be of me to go and cover every single dragon in 5th edition and not get into the actual playable draconic race in the setting? The dragonborn are extraordinarily misunderstood creatures. Hardly would you find a race in the Forgotten Realms that has suffered as much as they have, in spite of their natural goodness, and still be seen with fear and thought of as a monster. The Dragonborn look like monsters, which is already enough to scare most people, but the fact that this entire race didn't even exist in here until about 100 years ago makes even wise and established races, such as the Elves and the Dwarves, be suspicious of them. Let's talk about one of the most enigmatic playable races of all time. When I say that Dragonborn are misunderstood, I really mean it. So let's first dispel some of these misconceptions. A half-dragon and a Dragonborn are two completely different things. When you have a dragon have sex with something it shouldn't have sex with, then you get a half-dragon. A half-dragon will share features of both parents. And this is the same notion that follows the creation of a half-elf, of a half-orc, and a half-ogre. Literally just the intermingling of the two races who mate and create an offspring that that shares both genes. A dragonborn is not the result of a dragon mating with a humanoid. A dragonborn is its own race and has always been its own race since its beginnings. Second misconception, dragonborns do not openly venerate dragon gods. If you do, you are actually shunned from dragonborn society. There exist dragonborn clerics of Bahamut, but those that choose this path are typically exiled and outcasted from dragonborn cities. They are exceedingly rare as well. Dragonborn do not believe that there are dragons that are good, and they really don't believe in the existence of a dragon god who is good. Lastly, Dragonborn do not have a rich history on this planet, and they have only really been here for like a hundred years. When the player handbook suggests that they are a rare sight, they really do mean it. Boy, is there so much I have to explain, all of which is not even touched on by the player's handbook. You are truly in for a ride, my boy, on this one. Okay, so before I can even start with their history, we have to talk about the planet. This is the planet of Toril. This is where all of the campaigns for 5th edition start. Horde of the Dragon Queen, Tomb of Annihilation, Dragon Heist, they're all set on this planet in the setting that we call the Forgotten Realms. Now, technically, even Curse of Strat starts here. So, if you're playing on these books, this is the planet that you're in. Now, in the beginning of time, the gods fought the Primordials for dominion over the planet. By then, the planet was called Aber Toril. To stop the war, Overlord Io, the god of gods, decided to separate the planet into two planets, one for the gods and the other one for the primordials. Toril, as you know it, which is the planet that we have talked about basically on every single one of my videos, is the world that was given to the gods and the main planet that we actually play in. Abair, on the other hand, was given to the Primordials, and it resides on an alternate dimension occupying the same space in the solar system. Technically, what they did was they turned Europe, Asia, and Africa into its own planet, and then they turned America into a different planet. They then gave America to the Primordials, and they gave the rest to the gods, and then separated the planet into different realities occupying the same space. Basically. Now, this other planet, Abair, is different from the planet that we're used to. Magic there works differently. There is no weave, gods don't like going there or dealing with the people there, obviously, because it is the planet owned by the Primordials, so cleric magic is basically useless over there. But this is the planet where the Dragonborn were, well, born. Dragonborn didn't exist on Toril, the planet that we know, until just recently. All this time, they have instead been living in this other planet in this different dimension. In Abair, the world where the Dragonborn existed all this time, true dragons are kings and overlords. See, in the real world, in Toril, the dragon empires fell and collapsed. That's because dragons got into this massive civil war against one another. The followers of Bahamut, the dragon god of good, versus the followers of Tiamat, the dragon god of evil. Basically, cr chromatic dragons versus metallic dragons, right? They all fought and killed each other in this bloody civil war, 
which collapsed their empire. Uh, we also can't forget the, the giants, the mortal enemy of the dragons who also helped in the collapse of the dragon empires. They all fought each other. This actually never happened on Abair, the other planet. Religion never actually took place on that planet of Abair because the gods stayed the hell away from Abair because that was the whole reason for separating the planet. The second planet was supposed to be for the primordials, not for the gods. Because of this, the dragons grew rampant and completely dominated the planet. They even destroyed most of the primordials who ruled the planet. That's how strong the dragon empire there became. The dragonborn who also lived there were slaves to the dragons, and the dragons were not kind to them. They ruled with an iron fist, they were extremely cruel, and for millennia the dragonborn lived as slaves. Like literally millennia. Revolution after revolution, the dragonborn attempted to break free from the tyranny of dragons but were never successful, and were always treated worse and worse after each failed attempt at rebellion. Now, to travel from Abair to Toril and vice versa, it is actually extremely difficult. Allegedly, opening a portal from one to the other is almost impossible. The only way to cross would be through natural gateways, but those are very rare to find. It is so rare, in fact, that fey and elves and dwarves literally do not exist in Abair. These races were created by gods, so they never developed in Abair. Like, there's literally no way to travel there in any accessible capacity, it is that rare. Now, this all changed in the Spell Plague. Siric, the god of lies and trickery, murdered Mistra, the goddess of magic. And without the goddess of magic, magic went bananas everywhere, and this created what we call the Spell Plague. Eventually, a, a new Mistra, the, a new goddess of magic, took her place, but the damage was done. The Spell Plague had ravaged most of the world, entire civilizations had died, and magic had permanently changed. The Spell Plague actually created massive rifts between both Abair and Toril, to the point where entire areas were transported from one planet to the other and vice versa. This is how the Dragonborn made it to Toril through one of these transportations. In fact, an entire country of Dragonborn was transported from Abair to Toril. And this is how we got most of the Dragonborn that you see nowadays. This country is called Tymanther, and it was a civilization of Dragonborn that had actually rebelled against the dragons, the only successful one. The place was transported and placed here, in the region previously known as Unther. It is kind of far from the Sword Coast, where most of the campaigns take place, and it is why the Dragonborn are still very, very rare. The capital city is called uh, Djeratimar, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, but it is described as an enormous hollow pyramid of incredible size, unique shape, and virtually impenetrable in architecture. The city is a literal giant pyramid, rested on a granite foundation supported by huge columns. The top of the pyramid is set to reach about 1500 feet, or 460 meters, into the sky, and the only entrance into the capital is through an enormous wide ramp. Inside, the columns that support the pyramid are so big that enormous rings surround the columns, and on top of those rings you have entire commercial areas, with districts and houses. Unfortunately, this is not a video about Time Anther, so I have to let this one go for now, but this is virtually the main place where Dragonborn come from in the planet of Toril nowadays. Also, once again, keep in mind that the Spell Plague happened about 100 or so years ago, as per the contemporary time frame where these books are set, so Dragonborn really have not been here for all that long. If you're a new Dragonborn adventurer, your grandfather might have been telling you stories all this time about the old world, but you have probably never seen it, and probably never will. Now, what does this mean practically? Boy, it means a lot of things. Dragonborn throughout their entire history for millennia have not really have access to cleric spells, or by extension, religion of any kind. Because Abair did not have a weave of magic, being wizards was also completely new for the Dragonborn civilization. Now keep in mind that sorcery still existed in Abair, and Dragonborn are very good sorcerers, so they already had magic, but the wizard variety of magic is sorta of new and different for them. 
Now, religion in general is an extremely touchy subject for Dragonborn because it is their belief that they were created by the gods to serve dragons, or at least that's one of their many beliefs. Most common folk and Dragonborn peasants believe that the dragons of Abair bred Dragonborn and created them to serve as their slaves. But in any case, clearly they felt like they were made by slaves, and that's basically their history. It's always been that they've always been slaves. But in any case, prayers were never answered in the planet of Abair, and since many believe that gods created them to serve as slaves to the dragons, opinions on gods are at an all-time low in Dragonborn culture. They don't believe that any dragon god can be good since they prayed and prayed and prayed for millennia and their prayers were never answered. It was only through hard work and a lot of blood shed that this particular civilization of Dragonborn managed to free themselves from the oppression of dragons. If you're a Dragonborn, and you openly venerate and praise a dragon, whether it is a true dragon or a dragon god, you literally can get shanked on the street. Being a follower of Bahamut in Timanther is dangerous. There is no organized religion in this place, and typically personal belief on gods is, well, this is a very personal thing. It is rude to talk about religion and very frowned upon. If you believe in a god, you keep that to yourself and you pray in private. It is not officially outlawed to believe in a god and it is not punishable by the dragonborn government, but it is definitely kept private lest you embarrass your clan with your beliefs. Now that being said, some dragonborn have received a divine call now that they have made a tutorial. These dragonborn call themselves the Platinum Cadre. They are an organization of knights, clerics and paladins who follow Bahamut now that they're prayers have been getting answered. They are outcasts from Thymeri society and are not welcome there, just for their open veneration of a dragon god, but also because of their main teaching. Those who form part of the Platinum Cadre teach that Dragonborn came from the blood of Bahamut. They teach that Bahamut is a good dragon god and that he cares for his children. They also teach that not all dragons are evil, that some dragons are good. This belief system is, of course, laughed at by the Dragonborn of Timanther, whose tens of thousands of years of recorded history teach them the exact opposite. This is why the headquarters of the Platinum Cadre is currently in an abandoned section of the catacombs of their capital city. All right, that was that was something. It was a lot of backstory, but you guys really needed to know all of that, I think, just so that you could understand the civilization a little bit more. It's just a lot of necessary information about the race, and none of it can be found in the player's handbook. But now, let's finally touch on their physiology and psychology. First of all, Dragonborn do not have tails. Remember that. If you see a draconic-looking humanoid and it has a tail, then it is a half-dragon. And if you see a half-dragon, then you better pay close attention to its color. A red half-dragon is probably really, really evil. A green half-dragon is probably very treacherous. But a gold half-dragon is probably really good. If the draconic humanoid doesn't have a tail, then it is probably a dragonborn, and most dragonborn tend to side to good. This is a good rule of thumb for you to follow. Dragonborn colors are too interbred for them to really mean much. See, typically what you would find in dragonborns are a collection of a few colors. Typically you see scarlet, gold, rust, bronze, or brown. You would never see any of the really bright versions that chromatics or metallics typically have, and these colors also have nothing to do with their breath weapons. A scarlet-colored dragonborn could breathe acid from its mouth, and a gold-colored dragonborn could breathe electricity. The draconic ancestry is what really matters. What ancestry runs in your blood the most is what typically will define the breath weapon and sorcerer's powers that the dragonborn will have, whereas the scale color of your dragonborn is, the, is another thing entirely. In summary, the coloration of your scales do not matter at all, it is what's in the blood. Now, talking about that dragonborn blood, the bodies of dragonborn are hot enough to seem feverish to a human, which actually helps them a lot in colder climates. But at the same time, the bodies of dragonborn are hairless and big, and they have the ability to release heat from their bodies by opening their mouth very, very wide, which allows them to be as comfortable in hot climates as they are in cold climates. The scales of a dragonborn are tough, and they do protect them from incidental damage. It might protect them from stubbing their toes or getting scratched by their cats, but it will not protect them against purposeful attacks like spells or blades. A dragonborn scale actually cracks fairly easy against impacts meant to crack them. Dragonborn are born from eggs, just like true dragons are. Typically, a mother will lay one egg at a time, rarely two, but not more than that. A baby dragonborn will grow extremely fast, being the equivalent of a 12-year-old human by age three. 
By age 12, the Dragonborn will be considered to be matured in body, and by age 15, then the Dragonborn will be considered to be an adult by Dragonborn standards and society. A baby Dragonborn will be nursed by its mother for the first couple of months until the baby's teeth come out, at which point the mother will start weaning him off slowly with normal food, which for a baby Dragonborn is straight up meat. A Dragonborn couple will marry just for the process of procreation, and the marriage will only last until the baby is three years old. Then the parent who shares the same gender as the baby will take over and teach the baby everything it needs to know to behave well in Dragonborn society. The Dragonborn family unit is extremely small. Typically, it is either just the mated pair of Dragonborn or just the one singular parent and its only child. The clan, on the other hand, is extensive and much like the player handbook suggests, well, it is everything to the Dragonborn. A clan in Dragonborn society is a collection of different families that banded together sometimes thousands and thousands of years ago for unknown reasons. A Dragonborn will treat its clan as the single most important thing in its life, more important than its own family, more important than its friends, more important than its own survival. See, what defines a Dragonborn and everything that it does is its strict and overflowing sense of honor, honor that is tied to the also overflowing sense of emotions. You might not know, but Dragonborn are extremely emotional. Not in the sense that they will cry over everything, but in the sense that they care a lot about everything that they do. A Dragonborn doesn't just do something. He is the best, or will try to be the best, at doing that something. They lose themselves in the things that they do because they care. They care too much. They approach life with a natural enthusiasm. Passion for them comes readily. This fervor shows itself in the far extremes. They don't hide their anger or their joy or their sadness. Dragonborn are not timid, neither are they reserved. This is why they normally are extraordinarily charismatic. Be careful though, because they can seem somewhat paradoxical to someone who doesn't understand them. They are very charismatic and not timid at all. They are very emotional and open, but they are also feverishly independent. A Dragonborn does not rely on others. If they can do something by themselves, then they do it by themselves. They are extremely prideful and being helped doing something that they could have done by themselves hurts their pride. See, I mentioned before that the clan is everything to the Dragonborn. Well, everything that they do in their society is for the betterment of their clan, and each Dragonborn is expected to perform their duties for their clan without anyone telling them to do so, and without anyone helping them. You are expected to do your part for the greater good. They need to be seen as valuable. Now, a Dragonborn is not shy or timid about asking for help if it needs it. If the Dragonborn needs help, then it'll ask it, and it will not feel any pain or remorse about it. But if it doesn't need the help, then it'll never ask for it. This is why Dragonborn are seldom ever warlocks. Even though they have great capacity to be them, the idea of begging or asking or just generally relying on another entity for power is completely antithetical to what a Dragonborn is. This also applies somewhat to being clerics. You don't see a lot of clerics in Dragonborn, even inside of the Platinum Cadre. What you see a lot of are paladins. Investing oneself in the tenets of a mantra, or a direction, or a purpose. That's something that Dragonborn crave. Taking on an oath, dedicating your life to greatness, bringing honor to your clan. Now that is right up the alley of the Dragonborn. I'm not gonna pray to receive the help from another entity. I will become so strong instead and so purposeful that the entity will recognize me, see the value in me, and offer its help to me, which I will accept for the betterment of the clan and those around me. That's their mentality. See, one, they're emotional. Two, they're independent. And lastly, three, they're honor bound. Dragonborn society is heavily militaristic, and honor codes are huge in not just Dragonborn culture, but in every single member. A Dragonborn respects everyone, including their enemies. You will never see a Dragonborn purposefully disrespect a person if it can help it, even if that person is their greatest rival or the greatest villain that the world has ever seen. If you combine their emotional behavior with their feelings of being independent, plus the fact that they care so much about respect and honor, what you get is that most of what a Dragonborn does is so as to have other people gain respect for them. Everything that they do is so that other people see them as valuable to the clan or family or adventuring party or friends. 
Respect goes both ways. They respect people and they crave to be respected in return. This respecting a Dragonborn releases the fury within. <laughs> Honor and respect for a Dragonborn also translates in the importance of their word. A Dragonborn would rather die than break an oath, and it will never promise something that it cannot deliver. If a dying friend who the Dragonborn is holding in its arms were to ask, please Johnny, kill the Dark Lord, avenge me, the Dragonborn might literally just say no to the request if it doesn't think that he can do it. A human might just make the promise just to make his friend's last moments happier, but a Dragonborn would never try and make a promise or suggest a promise that it knew it wouldn't be able to keep. See, a Dragonborn does not fail. Ever. There is no, oh, well, at least you tried mantra for the Dragonborn. You either do or you don't. And if you don't, then you have failed as a person. And like we described before, a Dragonborn would rather die than fail its clan or fail in an oath. The only moment when a Dragonborn tries to accomplish the impossible is when the cost of an action would be too great. Like for example, when not rebelling against the Dragon Lords would cause Dragonborns to keep being slaves to them. A Dragonborn's word and promise is one of the strongest things you can get from them. The only other race that might be able to give you a stronger promise is a fey creature if they promise you something three times in a row. But other than that, Dragonborns might be up in there. Now, as part of the honor code of the Dragonborn, they actually need to raise their children well. They are honor bound to do so, actually. That's because without a strong and well-educated upbringing, a Dragonborn's fierce nature and emotional state typically results in feral savagery. When given a good upbringing, this fierceness and fervor turns to responsibility. Feral Dragonborn are scary as hell, so the Dragonborn society really does not want that. Now, strong principled behaviors and instilled daring and feelings of greatness, and of course, the mantra of no failure allowed, means that Dragonborn society rarely produces petty criminals. Dragonborn are naturally too proud to be petty criminals. Everything that they do, they do to be the best. So even though Dragonborn society produces fewer criminals, they instead produce more outright villains. Dragonborn are more likely to be bandit lords than pickpockets. Dragonborn will strive to be the best, regardless of whatever they do. This also shows in Dragonborn's usage and learnings of magic. For a Dragonborn's heart is as fierce as it is his magic. A Dragonborn rarely uses their magic for mundane things, for magic is the weapon of the mighty. No pitiful cantrips for a Dragonborn, thank you very much. I will not snap my finger to turn on a campfire using this cantrip. Instead, I will cut the logs myself and produce my very own flame with my mouth, and it will be the greatest campfire that you have ever seen. Lastly, because this has become a little bit of a staple on my dragon videos, let's talk about treasure. Dragonborn have dragon traits to them, of course. We already talked about the pride, but these draconic traits are also reflected in their enjoyment of treasure, especially gems. Dragonborn love gems, and they actually enjoy adorning themselves with them whenever they can. The independent nature of Dragonborn typically mean that Dragonborn crafters rarely make things for other people. See, it's, it's rare to see a Dragonborn architect that makes houses for other Dragonborn. They, they typically will only make things for themselves. The one exception to this rule is jewelry, for which Dragonborn society thrives on. Dragonborn crafters are well known for their ability to create awesome jewelry. Now, Dragonborn typically do not overindulge in personal adornment. They are not going to be obnoxious in wearing all the jewels they possess but they do have great style and they will definitely be the member of the adventuring party with the coolest and the most epic of armors. A Dragonborn Knight will dress itself in the most grandiose of armors, with crazy draconic shoulder pads and a helmet with grand horns, a spiky colorful knee pad, and a massive and awesome emblem of his clan right in the chest. You will know an adventuring party's Dragonborn by the epicness of his armor. The trick about a Dragonborn armor set are the bold colors. It's not just gonna be silver or gold. Dragonborn like fierce reds or bright greens or the obvious strands of blue. Really, really bold colors. They do not over garnish themselves in jewels, but their armors are grand and epic nonetheless. I would like to personally thank my Patreon supporters Rukado Fan, Major Fail Gaming, Wyatt Curlin, Barry Mascant, 5E Magic Shop, Thraxerus, Toby Oliver, Dylan Baker, Zach Bowell, and Mediogre at Best for supporting me on Patreon at the $25 level. 
If you would like to support me as well, then please, please head on over to patreon.com slash Rex to support. Thank you guys so much for watching. I have decided to do at least two videos, maybe one, maybe two. I, I still haven't decided, but I'm going to be doing two videos about some of the uh, some of the offshoot dragons that actually do not make an appearance on the monster manual because you guys have been asking for those a lot. I'm, I'm still not sure which one I'm going to do. I I'm definitely doing the steel dragon. Uh, I might do another one too after that. We'll see how it goes depending on how you guys like those videos. Videos, but yeah, just wanted to let you guys know um, that might actually probably be next. We'll see. Thank you so much for enjoying the video, and I will see you all in the next one. Bye-bye.